Uh, hello, my name is Stretch Hoff, and uh, I'm uh, an interviewer for the Public Library of Hamilton County in Cincinnati. Uh, today we're talking with Jack Ealing, and it is uh, September 23rd, and Dennis Daly is our operator today. So welcome to you, Jack. Appreciate it. Good to see you. Mm -hmm. uh, as we said earlier, this is a conversation about your life, truly. And so we'd like to start off uh, the very beginning. Where were you born? Uh, okay. And so forth. And tell us about your schooling. And so forth. I was born um, October 19, 1922, Reading, Ohio. I went to parochial school. Then I went to Roger Bacon High School in town. After the war, I went to Xavier University at pre-med, and I became a podiatrist. Mm -hmm. And I'm still a podiatrist. My license expires at the end of this year, and I'm going to duck it. out. Yes, sir. Is that right? So how many years have you been a podiatrist? Since 53, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah graduated in 52. Set the office up in 53, yeah. Oh, wow. Silverton. So you've been a Cincinnati born? And yeah, I had five brothers, yeah. Whole life. Wow. I had four other brothers in the military, three other brothers in the military. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where, uh, uh, you went to Roger Bacon High School? Yes, sir. Okay, then take us from there and how you got into the... Uh, military? Sir, yeah. I enlisted. I was one. I was one A in the draft, and so I, I just thought I'd better um, go in the Air Force rather than walk through the war, you know. Mm -hmm. So I did. And was that right out of high school? Was it? What, when well, you I got out in '41. Yeah, yeah and 41. I enlisted next year in November, and um, I think went to Fort Thomas. Yeah, and then they sent me to Miami. Never been out of Reading, and I got to Miami. <laughs> I said, "Wow, <laughs> be stationed down here for a while." Uh -huh. I was there about two weeks, and. Went to radio school, okay. Scottfield, Illinois. And where was radio school? Scottfield, Illinois. Okay. And I went to, um, after that, I went to Las Vegas, Nevada Gunnery School. Mm -hmm. And after that, they sent us to Salt Lake City. That was a staging area where the crews were formed. So was this about 1942? 43. 43. Mm -hmm. okay. And then uh, your crew was assembled there. Then they sent us to um, Moses Walla Walla and Moses Lake, Washington. Out in, out in the wilderness, so if you crash, you wouldn't hurt anybody. <laughs> is Walla Walla, is that the state of Washington? Yeah, Denver? and Moses Lake. Uh -huh. So we trained out there, yeah. Then, uh, how was it? After that, we came back to Scott Field, and we were given two weeks off. Then we picked up our airplane, and our bomber and flew it to, we supposed to go to Bangor. We wound up in Prescott because uh, the weather was bad. And we stayed overnight, took off the rest morning, the next morning in a storm. Blew through the night, and the next morning here we came out of Ireland. <laughs> Is that right? Wow, wound up in Presswick, Scotland. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, when we left uh, Prescow, the Red Cross gave us a case of cigarettes. Now they don't even want you to smoke. <laughs> that was a case. I'm not cartons, but a uh -huh. case of cartons. Uh -huh. Yeah. Of course, you're only a nickel a pack over there, you know, when you're on your base. Yeah. 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 That's the way it goes. So you, you were in England. Yes, sir, England. In, uh, we were not an hour more north of London, okay. the Wash, which is a cutout area on the east, east coast of, okay. of Britain. Now, yeah. isn't the 8th Air Force, isn't, isn't that the headquarters at the, during the Second World War was in England, wasn't it? I'm sorry. I don't the, was the head, where was the headquarters for the 8th Air Force? I really don't remember what it was. Okay. I really do not remember. I think Hap Arnold was the head man, though. I got my distinguished flying cross from General Spatz, I know that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so when you got to England then, did you start right in uh, with missions? No, you, you train, okay. you do more training, and, that, and then, you, then you train with your group, you know, around that area. Mm -hmm. so I think I got there in October. Yeah, in October. Then our first mission was November the 3rd to Wilhelmshaven. Yeah. Now how do you train? for bombing missions. How do you what? How do you train for bombing missions? What do you mean? Well, your training, was it, uh, what, what was involved in your training? Well, I was the radio operator. I didn't have to do very much, you know. Okay. Mostly it was done by the pilot, and co-pilot, and navigator, you know. Mm -hmm. But even the bombardier didn't have much to do. But, you know, when we were in, when we were in Moses Lake, you had air-to-ground gunnery, too. You, yeah, you had a, you could see it was a, it was a trail or something that, that the plane would follow. And you, 
over in, I think oh, when we were in Las Vegas, we had gunnery out of an eight, AT6, was it? You know, you had those hooks like a window washer, and that really? sleeve, they pull a sleeve, <sighs> and all of our bullets had colors. I don't think any of my colors were ever in that bullet. I was a marksman. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody got it. Now, as, as a radio gunner, that was your title. Yes, sir. What was your function during the missions? What would it be? So I monitored the radio until when we got to 9,000 feet, the pilot would say, you got to go on oxygen. So we did. And then we left the English coast. I had to get up and stand by my gun. My gun stuck out of the top of the plane. See, mm -hmm. It was a flexible gun, not a, not a, not a uh, turret. I faced, in other words, I faced the back of the plane. I could have shot the tail off. See, really? <laughs> yeah, there was no cutoff camp. Right. So was everyone, was everyone a gunner when it came down to... Uh, no, well, let's see, no, the bombardier didn't. Yeah. There was, I, after a while, I, I, I'm trying to remember, I think there was a, a 50 caliber gun in, there was a turret on one after a while, yeah. yeah. But the plane we ferried over, we did not get. And I think the B-17G had a turret, yeah. So I, I think I guess the, I guess the bombardier manned that thing, mm -hmm. yeah. But that's the way it was. When you got to nine thousand, you went on oxygen. Mm -hmm. Then when you went out and got over the North Sea, you could test fire your gun, that type. Mm -hmm. And then you just kept your eyes open, or your, your ears open, I guess. Twelve o'clock high. I used to hear that a lot. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, boy, I tell you. Did you shoot down any any fighters? Or? Um, that March the sixth, I claimed one. But so did the top turret. He had six planes, and they always gave preference to a turret over a flexible gun. They could have given me a half a kill, because the 109 went, came in at 2 o'clock, went right past, and he got out there and blew up. I could see the guy so close. <laughs> but he, yeah, our, our top turret had six planes, wow. to his credit. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were at, um, on uh, March the 6th, our plane was pretty well damaged. We had two engines out, and one's on fire, our oxygen is out, most of the cables are out, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, after we dropped our bombs, we went down to 5,000 feet. We were a straggler, you know? Mm -hmm. When you, I don't know, when you study gunnery, you study aircraft recognition. So you can see a plane way out there, you gotta, yeah. every time we saw one, we shoot out, we're coming back by ourselves, we saw it turned out to be a German, and then he came. <laughs> we went across Hanover at 5,000 feet. That was one of the heavily fortified cities in, uh, I'll tell you, and um, it was, um, all you could hear was that flak hitting the, I was only 22 years old, and I, we were going to Hanover, I said, I wish we'd blow up and get it over, because you knew what was going to happen, you know? Because yeah, yeah. I remember when we were hit, the pilot called the navigator, could we make it to Sweden or Switzerland? He said, we didn't enough gas. So I had to call Air Sea Rescue and tell them we were going to go down the North Sea, <laughs> see? But we didn't, see. Then I had to call uh, the base and tell them we had wounded. We had two of them wounded, you know. And uh, so we made it. Pilot couldn't stop the plane. It just cables finally all gave when they landed. Yeah. Back in England, right? Back in our base, yes, sir. Now, what, uh, during this time, what were your targets? What countries were you bombing? What, oh, was it Hanover? And well, the, I, my third mission was to Norway. We went to hit a heavy water plant in Norway, which is like, uh, at that time, it was, you know, I found out since it's part of the atomic type thing, you know. Because I remember in the briefing, they said, if you're hit by one bullet, you're going to explode, see. But uh, we went to Norway. We were supposed to get there when the workers were out to lunch. We didn't get it. <laughs> so I think the underground finally got it, yeah. yeah. I forgot how many hours that was. And I had about three or four to France. New Year's Eve, I was over Paris. <laughs> Bombing Paris. Yeah, you weren't down. There. Yeah. Celebrating. But I, I had a, we had submarine pens, Willemshaven. As a matter of fact, that, that was our first one. Went to Bremen a few times, Brunswick a few times, went to Gelsenkirchen, went to the Ruhr a few times. That was pretty heavily defended. Oh, yeah. And you got a lot of, had a lot of marshalling yards. You had um, airfields, you know. Mm -hmm. And, uh, boy, that March of 6th, oh, oh, I can still see all those parachutes. You know, the, the Air Force lost 60 planes on that day. My group lost 15 of those. Yeah, and I can still see it all the, there was uh, fellows that bailed out, being blown back into Germany, you know? Oh boy. Uh, boy. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah, I was reading that uh, the Eighth Air Force took very high casualties. Uh, yeah. They were like uh, 26,000 during the yeah. war. Our, uh, our um, group was famous, but they were famous for their losses. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. 
Yeah, we are. Uh, they played a lot of cards. We we're playing cards at night, and I hear this noise. You could tell it was the RAF going over, you know. And, uh, you know, everybody trusted everybody. We played a lot of poker, you know, and the fellow on the other crew wins a lot, and dice, you know, too. He's got all these pounds wrapped up with the rubber bands on the shelf. Nobody takes it. And they were worth $4.03 at the time. Yeah. 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 Now, uh, were you doing your bombing at night? Or no, sir. Time? We were day. They were talking about sending us out at night. I don't know too much about airplanes, but they said there was a blue flame under the cell of the engine or whatever that is, and that would not permit the, the bombers to go out at night. Yeah. So the RAF did it at night. Okay. We knocked it over in the daytime. The RAF one were set it on fire, and then the mosquito bombers harassed the fire. You know, you know that was that plywood airplane from Canada? I don't know about yeah. that. But you could, you could sit in the barracks. You could tell what plane was flying over just by the sound. Yeah, it's true. When did the, uh, the uh, new bombing devices come into uh, effect? You mean the uh, Nordic? Yeah. We had that, but after a while, what you did, you bombed on the Pathfinder. When he dropped his bomb, everybody dropped him. But you know when you dropped your bomb, we, we used to carry about eight, five, when you dropped your bomb, your airplane actually went up in the air. Yeah. yeah. And when we dropped, when, were, when we were going on the, was the IP, you know, when you were going into the target, I always pulled my radio door up because I could look right into the bomb bay and I had to tell them if all the bombs were gone, yeah. Fortunately, they were. How many bombs would you carry? You well, when we went to Norway, we carried two. Two 2,000 pounders. Usually we carried eight 500. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we carried phosphorus and rubber, sometimes fragmentation, but most of the time they were 500 pounds, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how long would a, a mission last? Oh, my. You know, you're going all over the... Well, if you count from the takeoff, you know, it's not like a jet plane today, you go right on up. When you're going to go to 25,000 feet, well, actually when you, to assemble, you got all these th hundreds of planes coming over, you know, and it takes quite a while to get up to that altitude with the, you know, with a prop plane. Yeah. So you're looking around, all you see are these dots all over these planes getting rendered to assemble, you know. And then finally you leave the coast. But it depends on where you were. My, my last mission, we actually bought the coast of France which turned out to be the, the buzz bomb site. My 24th was to Augsburg, Germany. You know, that's where Goring killed himself to commit a suicide. And then the two right in front of that were the Berlin raids. I guess maybe I had about three or four in France. We had airfields, you know, and the, we had submarine pens. I had a pretty nice sitting at my table, you know. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, you know, when we, were t when we take off, I was at my radio, and I was there. When you're going down the runway, well, this is road across the, uh, the runway, see? And there was always an MP on both sides, and I, when we passed there, we weren't off the ground. I'm trying to lift that plane off the ground, <laughs> lift the table. <laughs> so you said there were hundreds of planes in a, in a raid. How many? Hundreds? Oh, percent. that'd be a small amount. Is that right? Five, six hundred. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Boy, that's a lot. So you were, uh, you said you had 25 missions. I had 25 missions, yes, sir. Okay. And that doesn't count the missions they aborted. You know, some of you are called back and yeah. you dropped your bombs in a channel in the North Sea. You didn't credit for that, you know. But these were 25, you actually dropped your bombs, you know, yeah. And that was the point, at that point in time, if you had 25 missions and you were they, out? They said, you're it. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, but after that, they started, like I told Dennis, uh, if somebody saw 30, mission 35, they, they, most of them didn't even see a German fighter, you know, because of the air supremacy that, uh, that the, uh, we had. Mm -hmm. I remember for, we used to, at the beginning, we just had the RAF escort. Mm -hmm. And I remember finally we got 51s, P-51, P-40, and I remember one mission I saw these things hanging down below the wings of, uh, 51s and the 47. I said to the pilot, are they carrying bombs? He said, no, they're carrying gas, which means they could take us all the way in. Okay. Then those things were empty. They salvaged that uh -huh. little, yeah. Guys were throwing, fellows on the crew would ride and sit on uh, ammunition boxes, throw them out the window. <laughs> <laughs> Guys throw a bicycle out. <laughs> How was he killed? He killed by a bicycle. <laughs> oh, man, they're really chucking a lot out, yeah. 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 Um. You mentioned the one where you came in at 5,000 feet and your 
Oh yeah, that's when we were hit. Uh, was that the closest call you had? Uh, oh yeah, yeah, next to being shot down. Oh. I really, like I say, I really thought we were gonna blow up was just, you know, our engines were on fire. One of them, the four, number four engine was actually fire. You see the flames coming out, and our pilot was feathered the engine was able to blow it out, see. Mm -hmm. And then our, our oxygen was out. Most of the cables were gone. So uh, 5,000 feet, that's not very high. Was it, were you hit on your return? Were you, you dropped your bombs and you were mm -hmm. coming home? That's when you were hit. Oh, yeah, when we were hit, we had to go down right away because no oxygen, you know. Yeah. We had to walk around bottles, you know. It was good for about maybe 15 minutes. Yeah. But we didn't. I could, I, I'll tell you, if I had to go out, I probably wouldn't be, I had a, I had a chest pack parachute. Mm -hmm. And the enlisted men, other than the top turret, would be in my radio room. They'd sit on my parachute. <laughs> I, I, never, I never thought of that going out and yeah. getting, I thought I was gonna jump out of there. Yeah. I never gave it a thought. Uh -huh. I'm telling you, now I think of it. Now, was your airplane, this one that you were, the engines were on fire, were they able to salvage that plane or was it? Uh, well, after, when we were through, Another crew took it over. I forget how many missions it, and I think it wound up in Arizona for scrap, yeah. yeah. Superstitious Aloysius. Did I tell you that? No. It was this little gremlin or what, and, and uh, you know, the nose arc. Mm -hmm. He had his peaked hat on, he had a four-leaf clover, he had a wishbone, he had his fingers crossed, he had a horseshoe, and everything else that's, uh, but that was named by our, our radio, our um, ball turret gunner. Mm -hmm. Superstitious Aloysius. So when was, when was your uh, last flight, your 25th mission? That was March the 19th of 44. 44. See, then, then, then when it had a crew over, you, you, you uh, trained the next people coming into it. You know, what can you, what, can you, what can you do to train a radio operator? You only do one thing, you know. But all I do mainly is get up and go to breakfast and go to the library. <laughs> well, you had to train on that gun. You uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, they, uh, uh, we took, the United States took a lot of casualties with the Air Force. Oh, I, yeah. It was really a couple of years ago. I was just amazed. I guess I didn't really think of the number of casualties. Oh, yeah. But the constant uh, training of pilots and gunners and radio people and the building of airplanes. And I think that's one thing that I read that uh, the Luftwaffe didn't do. They, didn't they essentially run out of pilots, didn't they? Oh, yeah. yeah. Sir? They essentially ran out of pilots. Oh, yeah. But um, once the, once the um, U.S. got air supremacy, then um, they didn't lose so many because the, the RAF, I mean, the, the, Waffle, the Luftwaffe didn't have too many planes left anymore to come up. Because I remember that in Berlin, right? We were hit by fighters. Eight of them wingtip to wingtip coming at us. Yeah. Sometimes they come out of the sun, yeah. Now when was that, what, what date was that? Can you recall that you were on the Berlin missions? Berlin, March, March the 6th of 44. 44. That was our number 23 mission. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you, it was really great when you finished. Uh, unless you volunteered, uh, you, but when I got back, to, we came back, we came back on a, on a ship called uh, the Aquitania. No evasive, we had no escort, no nothing. And this is in 44, you know, the U-boats are out there? Yeah. And the listed men are always way down below. The, they'd still be looking for me if we'd have gone in. Anyway, what was I going to say? <laughs> oh, boy. Um, what was I going to say, Marion? <laughs> Somebody tell me what I was going to say. Oh, yeah. We came back, we got a month off you know, for, then they sent me to Florida and you know, for your nerves, you're down there. Mm -hmm. They're gonna send you out, you get on the windowsill and say, I'm gonna jump, better keep me another week. You know? <laughs> anyway, uh, I was sent to Galveston, Texas after that. And uh, if, you're a, if you're a part of a flight crew, I think you had to fire six hours and then you got your, your flight pay, which is half your base pay. They did that a couple of months. I'd fly radio for somebody going to Minneapolis or something. And I got to thinking, this is kind of stupid. Why should I fly now when I finish my missions and get piled up on some runway with some young guy? So, so I went and got myself grounded. And then I wound up on the uh, radio, the ground radio, see? Mm -hmm. 
And we were on a network with Barrinquen Field in Puerto Rico and uh, Batista Field in Cuba and also out in the Midwest. See? And I'd be on the, I'd be on the, the radio at night. You, you know, you're talking code. Uh, so I subsequently heard there was a shipment going out. It was called the Gypsy Task Force. And I went, well, found out what that And I heard this was something going to the Caribbean. So I volunteered. See? That was one of the greatest moves I ever made. Yeah. So they, I think I, they sent about eight of it. I was in li ranking enlisted man and about seven other people put us on this um, C-47, flew us to Orlando, and after there a day or so, no, we went to Maxwell Field in Alabama, then Orlando. Then we got on this plane and we're going to Cuba, see? And we landed at Guantanamo Bay, and I said, man, this is great. The Navy base, they eat great, see? We're gonna finally get some good food. They gave us cold cuts. <laughs> <laughs> so we're there several days, and this one fellow said to me, when are we gonna get out of here? I said, I don't know why. We're right next to the we orderly room. <laughs> yeah, we're right next to the orderly room. So I went, the guy said, we had you AWOL. I said, we've been next door for two weeks. <laughs> so they stuck us on the plane and sent us to uh, uh, Barranquin Field in Puerto Rico. Actually, what they were doing, they were flying, these were B-29 bases. They were flying navigational hops from the Midwest and they were carrying concrete bombs. They getting, I guess they were getting ready to go to the Pacific. And I was down there when Roosevelt died, and then um, I think the war ended in Europe when I was down there. Then they sent me back to uh, Nebraska. Nebraska, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and got out and when I got mustered out or whatever they call it, discharge, October of 45. How, mu how much time was there between your missions? Was there oh, sometimes the next day. Actually, what happens is if, when you, <clears throat> when you, you know, you're sitting around wondering if you're going to fly the next day and somebody would go over the order, they either have a yes or no, a sign on the door, orderly room door. Yes, you're going to be a mission, see? And you didn't know if you were going to fly or not, so when you went to bed next day about 3 o'clock in the morning, they're shaking you. <laughs> Coke screw, get up. <laughs> That's the only time we had a nifty breakfast. I guess it was a, before they put you in a, the chair, they give you a nice meal. <laughs> Drinking, drinking the orange juice, drinking juice out of the, that mess kit thing, <laughs> aluminum. But they gave us the eggs, you know, really. And then, yeah, before we took off, the Red Cross always gave us a candy bar and, a, and a, an orange. Hmm. I put it on top of the radio. It was always frozen when I got <laughs> <laughs> oh, Yeah, and then when you came back from the flight, they, they, you interrogate, you know, the tables, yeah. ask you what you saw and that type of thing. Well, at 25,000 feet, you were cold up there, weren't you? Oh, man, 60 below zero yeah. sometimes. Had those... We had a heated suit. Yeah. We had a heated suit, heated gloves. Didn't have boots heated. Yeah, we had boots because the tail gunner's boot was always shorting out. That was it, yeah. But sometimes it was 60 below zero, 70 below zero. We had those, you know, we fly a vapor trail. They call them contour. And it sounds fizzy. It sounds like alka You could hear it fizzy, you know? Yeah. <laughs> But I tell you, those Germans were good with flak. They got, you felt like there was so much of it, you could almost smell it. <laughs> they were, they'd have your route to do, but maybe, maybe another 100 yards out, 200 yards out. They were accurate people. Now, how, how high were you flying during the raids? Usually from 25, 26 to 29,000. Okay, yeah. so that was really... I think I was, when I tell you, I saw that thing, I was clear for about 20, 38,000, whatever that means. We never went that high. But we're always, I don't, I don't think we're, I'm, I think we went about 13,000 feet when we went to Norway. Yeah. Now, can you tell us something about the, I don't know, like the percent of planes that would get hit? Oh, on almost every one of them every time at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Well, they all came back with holes in them, yeah. Oh, yeah. Of course, they'd be over France, mm -hmm. you know, we did. When was it? The last, our last mission <laughs> to uh, France. Mm -hmm. That was the French coast. Turned out to be a buzz bomb. So Protestant chaplain went with us. He walks, you know, when he walks through the radio room, and then you got through the bomber. His May West catches on the thing and inflates. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But by God, there was a lot of flack. You know, you get briefing. You know, they tell you about uh, what to expect. They said very few, very few guns. There's a lot. They lost quite a few people, yeah. So the, the buzz bomb, you were bombing the locations where the those buzz were bombs there. came after I came back, right, okay. yeah. All right. Mm-hmm. That was after mine. I really, I was over, I was over there, in, yeah, started in November and finished in March, you know, that's, 
That's right. I was in Washington, D.C. last weekend and saw the new Navy Memorial, or the Air Force Memorial. Oh, yeah? With a, it's like with three airplanes going up really? like that with one missing. Usually they have four planes yeah. like that. One missing. And one's missing. So yeah. But it's really, and you can see it from all over the city. It's very impressive. I know a couple of fellows that went up on that um, honor flight, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. I had an application for it, but I never filled it out. Yeah. Yeah, I know a couple of fellows are up there. He said it's really nice. He said, they uh, pick you up, they take you up there, they feed you. Yeah. He said the people around there want your picture taken with you. <laughs> Isn't that wild? Yeah. Well, I have a friend who's a guide, and yeah. he just did two honor flights this past week. Really? And he said it was just a terrific experience yeah. because everybody is. I think a lot of fellows, a lot of those fellows that sent their application died before they could take them. Mm -hmm. I think. It, didn't I read somewhere they're going to start picking them up in Cincinnati now? You have to go to Louisville or somewhere. Or Dayton, I think. Dayton, yeah. I think I read somewhere that they were going to uh, start a flight out of here. Mm -hmm. I met there a lot of canes yeah. and hearing aids and wheelchairs on those things. You ought yeah. to go, though. I'm what? You ought to go on that flight. Uh, I don't have any desire to. And, although uh, I know a friend of mine was a navigator. And, he owns Silverton Hardware. He sent his application in. He sent two of them in. <laughs> he said he'd like to go. Yeah. I guess maybe I would. You're up there in the same day and back the same day, yeah. I think. Yeah. I think it is, yeah. It'd be quite an experience, I guess. Well, I, some of the reading I did um, about the Mighty Eighth. Mighty Eighth. Mighty Eighth. Of course, as you know, they're still very active. Um, they were put together with other units, so they're still very active today. It still is? Yeah. And they probably jet are they jets now? I probably yeah oh yeah, yeah. and yeah. I, I well from my reading I couldn't uh, it was part of the strategic air command and went all through all these things but it's been active in yeah. Afghanistan and Iraq yeah yeah but it's interesting to me in uh, from May of forty two to July of forty five mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> there were twenty six thousand casualties which uh, is one half of the U.S. Army Air Force casualties in the war. Wow. The bombing. But there were 17 medals of honor and 220 distinguished service crosses, which did you Service cross or flying crosses? Uh, I wrote service crosses. Well, I had a flying the cross. Okay. I had four medal, air medals and, the fl and distinguished flying That's cross. Easy, and a presidential citation for the yeah. Berlin radio. Okay. And then 442,000 air medals. Yeah. Air medal. We got that after five missions. And then you fight 10, you got another, you got a cluster, mm -hmm. Oakley. Then after 20, you got three clusters, then, then we got our distinguished flying cross, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Used to get $3 extra for that. Yeah. Permission? On your pay. Did, yeah, so you got the distinguished flying cross, you got three bucks extra. Isn't that wild? Today you could almost buy a gallon of gas with <laughs> <laughs> That's probably what it's worth now in an antique store, three bucks. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, we're flying one mission. I remember they brought this big box in and they, and they, into the and they gave, put it in my radio room. And this fellow said, "Now, when you fly, interruption, you start throwing this stuff out of the window. It was, it was called um, chaff, tin foil. It's supposed to throw off the, uh, the uh, radar or something. Yeah, radar stuff. yeah, it was like spaghetti. You throw it up in the air and it scatters all. Yeah, I just remember that. A whole box of those, chaff." Sounds very scientific. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it worked. <laughs> yeah. So do you have any other stories about your missions or uh, your time in England? Yeah. Sometimes the Guarani Flying Circus got after us. Those are Fock Wolves. They had the colored spinners on, the, on their planes. Hmm. And they called that the Guarani Flying Circus. The Abbeville kids from Abbeville, France, yeah. Most of the time we saw 109s. Yeah, they bomb our base at night, you know. Did you lose many planes that way? Or no, they sent a lone plane over at night, you know, and they put a bomb right in the middle of our runway. I'm, I jumped out of bed and almost clawed my way through the wall where we were in the door. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I started flying, we carried a pistol, you know, sidearm. And after we, after we had a mission, we, we would come home and turn on the radio. They listened to Lord Haw Haw, you know. Mm -hmm. And they said, he announced any airman caught with a gun would be at the mercy of the people who captured him. So after a while, they hung the door, on, hung the gun up on a 
nail never took it with us anymore. Yeah. Had to touch all the bases, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, of, of the people that parachuted yeah. out, what was the relief effort there, or the rescue effort? What do you mean? Well, in France, you couldn't. You just couldn't. Ground, oh, no, no, you, you hope that the uh, underground got hold of you. That's why the, we got that uh, escape picture, you know. Mm -hmm. I told you everybody had the same outfit when they had the oh, picture. That, okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and if, the, if you've got in the hands of the underground, you're okay, they could give you a passport. And I knew some, I met some of the fellows that made it through, they go over the Pyrenees, you know. Mm -hmm. Then you met some and got right to it and were, they were captured, yeah. But uh, a, lot of, a lot of my friends were shot down, they really were. We, we had a couple of them would take off and blow up, you know, didn't make it. We'd take off in rain, snowstorms, mm -hmm. you know, dark. Yeah. But, uh, you know, you're flying 13 hours, you're up for a while, you know. Uh, at the time, Tell me about the status of radar at the time. I'm sorry? The status of the radar technology at that time? Well, I think that the lead, the lead bomber had it. I guess that's what it was, the planes like we did. After a while, I think they, they only had about nine men on their crew because he didn't really need a bombardier. When, you know, or, I forget who was, who was the ninth man, the tenth man they, that they did away with. But when they had the saturation bombing, then you just bombed on the path of the lead plane. When he dropped, and everybody dropped him, you know. Mm -hmm. And we had that toward the end of my missions. We, had, we did that, yeah. That was really something. When you dropped those bombs, those eight, five, your plane really went up in the air. You could feel it, I'm telling you. Before you went in the service, did you have a desire to fly? Is this, no. Or you just didn't want to walk, you said. No. <laughs> As I say, I didn't want to walk through the war, so I enlisted in the Air Force. Yeah. And why? I didn't know why. I didn't request flying. Mm -hmm. All I had was high school education, you know. Mm -hmm. I used to work at Merrill Company before that. The in Reading. Chemical, chemical it was in Reading. Reading, yeah. They were bought out by Dow later. Yeah. I used to be like everybody else, right? Merrill Company on a bomb or Reading or <laughs> Roger Bay. <laughs> he always wrote something on it. Roger Bay. The only thing is, the guy said, if one doesn't go out, I gotta get out there and kick it out. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't happen. It's, it's always amazing to me how they had all these young guys, and I don't know how long you trained to be a pilot. Can you tell me that? I do not know. A good deal longer than it takes to be a gunner, I know that. But all of a sudden you're up there and you're... Yeah. I think our, I think our top, turret, top turret engineer, he probably could have flown the plane if he had to, you know, bring it in. See, each plane had two radio operators and two engineers. Our top turret engine was an engineer, and so was our ball turret gunner. I was the radio, and our right waist gunner was a radio. Mm -hmm. But I was first, so if I'm first, I get to be a tech sergeant. I got f five stripes. Uh -huh. But they said everybody, uh, the, I think they said the laws during war, if, if the countries adhered to it, you were, you were a, uh, uh, a non-com, they can only put you in certain kind of work. You know, so that's why I guess everybody on the plane was a sergeant, a, staff, a tech sergeant, and, and a staff sergeant. But they only give you certain kinds of work. So you had nine in your career, did you say? Ten. Ten. Later on there. i tell you about that, that um, March the 6th bomb. When that 109 came in from 2 o'clock, as they say, put a shell in our, on the, in our side of our waist and it exploded. And the right waist gunner turned around. He's a mass of blood, you know. So I called Cope the pilot, and I said, Walker's just bleeding. He said, if he's bad enough, put a chute on him and throw him out. The Germans will pick him up. But we didn't do that, you know. Anyway, before that happened, our, our tail gunner was hit twice. He was hit back there, the left waist pulled him out, and while he was on the, by the tail, he was hit again, yeah. But that was our 23rd. They, their missions were over then. They were, they, they'd got the Silver Star and the Purple Heart, yeah. But, uh, yeah, boy, when we came in, Walker's face, that was our right, his face was like this. But, well, tell me about putting him in a parachute, what were you saying? Yeah, that's not unheard of. If they're really bad, put a parachute, pull the ripcord, and throw them out the door. It'll, it, you know, yeah. they'll, they'll land in Germany and they'll take care of them. Sure. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. But I wasn't going to take that, uh, you know, on myself to do that. No. Well, the, the other waste gunner would have had to do it. I thought the waist gunner should have been decorated, but he did a lot. Okay. 
he's the guy that uh, I was telling Dennis, over 50 years, never missed Sunday school. <laughs> so you know he was a good guy. <laughs> yeah. North Carolina. What percentage of the guys were like, were like you that flew 25 missions? What? How, how many, or what percentage of the people I, flew 25? I really don't know. It wasn't I mean, very high, was it? I forget what your, statistically you weren't supposed to finish. I think about 11 or 12 was about all you're supposed to, before you're gone. Somewhere around there, I think. But the, you just mark it off, boy, 20, 21. Yeah. <laughs> you paint the bombs on the, on, the, on the nose of the plane, you know. Okay, so you came home from Europe mm -hmm. in... I came in 44. 44. I remember getting up on a Tuesday morning, June the 6th, D-Day, you heard on the radio, yeah. Uh -huh. But I finished, in, I finished in March, so that's three months later, you know, yeah. And you were home by then? I was home on, a, I guess, 30 days or how much time they give you, and I heard that on the radio that they invaded over there. Mm -hmm. And then I... What were you thinking when that happened? <laughs> I'm glad I'm here, I'm I guess. You, were, <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. you don't realize how lucky you were, really, you know? I'll tell you, the people who won the war were the ones that fought it on the ground. They're the guys that won the war. A friend of mine still has shrapnel in him. He was in the, in the uh, infantry. Mm -hmm. He was hit about four or five times. He ought to get down here, boy. Mm -hmm. He's 90 years old now. Mm -hmm. He has really had some experience. You, it's interesting talking to those fellows who were in, the, who were in the combat on the ground. Yeah. Oh, they all say they were just lucky to oh, be alive. Oh, no. just... terrible. Yeah. I would not. That is the reason I enlisted. I don't know what made me think about it. I wasn't too smart at the time, but I did that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you were pretty smart. It worked out for mm -hmm. <laughs> Now, when did you meet your uh, wife? You want to tell us about life I worked at Merrill's, and she was a secretary over there. Uh-huh. Right? What? I said, you were the secretary at Merrill's when I met you. Cute. <laughs> 19. <laughs> hmm? Cuter. Still cute. Yeah, yeah and um, how was it? If, if they stayed so what year was it? Okay, when you were completely out of service, it was 1945. 45, yeah. Okay. Hey, if, so, I had, if the state of Ohio hadn't paid us a bonus, I'd still be single. <laughs> <laughs> so how old were you, about? 45? Yeah. I was uh, 20. 22, you were 23 40, years old. 23 years old, 23 yeah. Years old. Okay. 23, and I, I used the GI Bill. I went to the Xavier University to study pre-med. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was going to use that if I had to take home economics. You can't pass the GI Bill. Guys were taking flying lessons, dancing lessons. Is that sure. right? So we came out of the service and uh -huh. went to work at, or went to Xavier. Yeah. Well, you know what? I worked at Merrill before the war, and when I was going to Xavier and Fremont, they let me come over there and, you know, free hours and do some work. Yeah. Okay. So I was still making a few bucks. Then I went to Xavier. Well, at that time, I went to podiatry school. At that time, I had two years pre-med. Now it's, you have to have an undergraduate degree right now. So about eight or nine years, and that was six years when I was in. So I went on. We got married in '48, and that's when I went to foot school. Okay. Yeah. And how many children do you have? And grandchildren? Any of we have. A, we have a daughter in Columbus. We have a daughter in Westport, Connecticut. We have a son in uh, Indianapolis. Uh -huh. Six grandkids. Great. My daughter in um, Westport married to a Spaniard. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. They lived in France for a while, and they're going to have to go back again. He's with the Société Générale, which is a yeah, French bank, as you know, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Good guy. So when the war was over, where were you? Were you uh, Xavier at that time, then? I, went, I was living at Reading, yeah. Okay. And I was studying pre-med at X. And you know, when I had free hours, Merrill would let me come in and work a few hours. And then after I did my required two years, we went to foot school in the Cleveland. Mm -hmm. Four more years up there. Was it Case Western or where was it? I'm there? sorry. What, what school was it up there, Case Western? Ohio College of Podiatry. Okay. It's uh, one, all of our professors were from Western Reserve Medical School. You know. Yeah, one block from that. Now they have their own, I forget, in, in Independence, Ohio, I think. But I'm not licensed. I still make some house calls. You but, do? Yeah, that's hard to believe, isn't it? Yeah. But, my, you, you know, you have to be licensed every two years. Mine expires in December, so I'm going to 
cash in. So you and Gary can play golf together. He's oh, I can't even, I gave my golf clubs away. Okay. You couldn't see a ball anymore. <laughs> That's terrible. Yeah. But uh, I might take up taking naps. That's a good thing. <laughs> I have a degree in that already. Yeah. Uh -huh. but, uh, Is there anything else about being in the Air Force you'd like to tell us? You know anything, Mayor? You know what? About the Air Force? Today. Fought the Battle of Omaha, Nebraska. <laughs> Used to bomb, we were going to Fairfield, used to bomb all the way through Lincoln, Nebraska, and go to Omaha just to get away. Mm -hmm. oh, nice. Castle Hotel, I guess, Douglas County. <laughs> Why is it I remember all that and I can't remember last week? Huh? That's is that something? You say it happens, you know. I, I can't remember. remember stuff I did yesterday sometimes. Just like it was yesterday, yeah. I can remember. Yeah. And I said to her, What did I have for breakfast this morning? I don't know. <laughs> well, we certainly thank you for oh, I appreciate sharing it. your experiences with us. We, uh, I appreciate it. It's fun to talk to you people. You always learn a lot. At least I always learn a lot. What's, what's I appreciate it. Thank you. So, uh, okay. Well, we're I might talk to that friend of mine that's uh, 90 years old. He has a bad heart, but you talk about a fellow with some experience. He, you can still you can feel the shrapnel in his hand. Yeah. But he, was he in the Air Force also? So no, sir, he was in the infantry. Okay. Right. And he was, yeah. well, you in the infantry when you're a scout or whatever it is. He, had, he was one of the guys out ahead, you know. Oh, yeah. I forget. Yeah, I think he's out of three, about three or four of Purple Hearts. Oh, yeah. Wow. I know a couple. I know a couple of fellows. I talked to one scout. Uh, what's his name? His name is Richard Nowak. Nowak, he's in Silver, lives in Silverton. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, I, I, I said to him a couple of times, somebody had told me about what you folks do, and I said, you ought to really go down there, they want people like you. I said, you want to get out there before you die, you know. He has a bad heart, but next time I see him, I'm going to tell him to yeah, call you. Done. Dennis, yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. he, boy, he, he's amazing, I'll tell you. And he sure is. But you talk to somebody that's fought on the ground, boy, they have some experience. Yeah, they do. Yeah. You know, when we weren't flying, we, got, we were, came back and went to bed at nights, nice sheets, you know, good food. Shower. Oh, yeah, uh, guy. We'll go to the movie. But they didn't have that. Well, you were, you were taking a lot of chances in what you were doing, too. I'm sorry, I should bring my hearing aid. <laughs> yeah. no, I said you were taking a lot of chances well, in what yeah. you were doing, also, so it wasn't. But when that day is over, you, you, you got it made, you know? Yeah. yeah. But when you, you know, you never give, when you get to five missions and then ten, finally you get to twenty, you say, boy, if I can just last for five more. Yeah. <laughs> and that last, you know, on the last mission, they always let the, uh, the crew that's flying 25, they always let that pilot lead the squadron, and that was us. And we had a, an extra, we had a co-pilot was finishing up because our other two pilots were killed. And we're coming in for a landing, and the pilot pulls up his wheels and he goes back. And we buzzed that field with a bomber. I bet we weren't 10 feet off that ground, you know? And I was an enlisted man. <laughs> And I called up Captain Cope. I didn't care if he, but I said, if you want to kill yourself, get me on the ground and come back up. I said, I didn't care what he did. I said, I don't want to die this way. I'm telling you, I never heard of buzzing a field with a bomber. I bet he went 10, 15 feet off that ground. And down he went again. Oh. Big celebration. I'm telling you. But you know, he, he was from Two Rivers, Wisconsin. And uh, when he came back, he became a fighter pilot. Boy, he had a magnificent uh, military career. Big fisherman. When he died, he was cremated and he scattered his ashes on the, the lake, you know. Is that right? But we, you can almost tell the crew was going to finish. Never gave your pilot any trouble. You did exactly what you, well, you had to go to a meeting. You were there, you know. I don't know. It just seemed like that. But some of those guys wind up in the stockade. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But the pilot was the boss. Uh, yeah. You did what you were told to do, and I, I, I was talking to Morrison, and he sort of thought the same way. You could just almost tell. You did what you were supposed to do. Now, did you always fly with the same pilot, assuming he wasn't killed? Uh -huh. I mean, yep. So you, you kept same. your crew together, your ten guys together, same crew. as well as you possibly could. So you were in the, the, the enlisted men were in their own barracks. You weren't with the pilot, and we were, we were not with the officers, and there were about four crew from enlisted men in our barracks. Six enlisted men, you know, my crew, and, 
and three others that met, what, 24 people. So you got to know those crews pretty well, and a couple of those were shot down, you know, yeah. But you always flew, and of course, after our, we lost our co-pilots, both of them, we wound up with other fellows were finishing up their missions. They had, they had one or two missions to go, you know. Well, that's what you do. But uh, I bet those last four or five missions were so Oh, I'm telling you. I thought the last one, that's nice. We're going to hit the coast of France and come right back, you know. Yeah. Boy. That was a lot more. That's when the old uh, chaplain was with us. <laughs> Those were short missions, weren't they? Because I'm sorry? Those were very short missions, weren't they? Oh, yeah, right across the channel. Yeah, just 20 miles. Matter of fact, I think, we were, I think we were circling with our Bombay doors open to go over there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we weren't really that high either. But their intelligence was way off because there were lots of guns there. Mm -hmm. You know, you take off from, you know, especially you're flying, say, in February, you could always tell the. German airfield because it you know, snowed a lot and you can see their runway. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. You ever see that movie, uh, Memphis Bell? No. Oh. Show these fellows up in the air smoking. That wouldn't happen on oxygen. <laughs> That's <laughs> yeah. Hollywood. Man. Well, they, have, they occasionally have these bombers out at uh, Lincoln Airfield. Hey, there's one in Silverton. I mean, uh, Blue Ash. Is it right now? A fellow owns a LCI lighting. Um, had this take, taken from uh, up in Canada somewhere, out of the ice. He brought it down. He restored that. A lot of the fellows who worked at GE worked on the engines, and their pipe fitters worked on it, electricians, all for free. And as soon as they build uh, uh, Blue Ash, finally bought some ground from Cincinnati, who owns that airport. And they're going to build, this fellow's going to build a museum, and he's going to move it in there. But he has, he has jeeps from off the battlefield, he has tanks. Yeah, he's going to move it all in there. I, I crawled inside that bomber out at Lincoln. Yeah, I which one? 17? I think so. Yeah. It was, is it the uh, Confederate Air Force? Or yeah, 17. Oh, the 17? I saw it. I thought, oh my gosh, I just, I really appreciated what you guys went through up there. Yeah. You know, when the, I, 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 had, I hadn't been in one for years and years and years and finally I thought, I remember that radio room being like our living room, and then when I finally got to go in this, I could hardly get around that ball turret. <laughs> I said, "What a drabby place this radio room is!" You know. Well, now for like three or four hundred dollars, you can take a ride in it. Yeah, I think Gary Lowy did. Did he do that? No, I didn't. No, Gary Lowy is. Gary. A, yeah. He, matter of fact, he was over to my base uh, last year. I think he told us. Uh -huh. He was over there. We went to uh, was it Duxford? Where they have that? They have a. Uh, Cemetery, you know, and we were there a couple of times. Matter of fact, we were in France. We went to Normandy Beach Cemetery. Mm -hmm. That is really something to say. Yeah. We were over there. I forget what Gary Louis told me. He'd paid three hundred dollars, four hundred dollars to fly. Mm -hmm. I have no desire to get in that thing again. When I got, when I went in there, you know, when I got to go through that, I thought, my God, I didn't realize that thing was so small. Really, <laughs> and and. It's, Four other guys got in that radio room beside me. No, yeah, five of them. It was in top turret. Was up front. Five of them got in there beside me. Well, when I was first married, which was 1960, we were out in California, Mayor Island, and I got to go on a nuclear sub. Oh, did you? Which was I, I forget. I think it was the Roosevelt, maybe. My wife wasn't allowed to go on, but. I had all these pictures you see from movies of how spacious things are. Well, not true, is it? Forget it. Yeah. Not true. It's amazing. Yeah, not true. Yeah, I had three other brothers. I had two in the Navy, one in the Army, but we all got back. Yeah. Now, where did your brother serve? I meant to ask you about that. My uh, oldest brother was a torpedo man on a, on a destroyer, and he was in the refrigeration business. My brother Carl was in. The Army. I really don't know what he did. My brother Bob was in the Navy. And uh, just the two of us, my brother Bob and I, are the only ones left. But got, my, wife, my wife had six boys. My wife. <laughs> my mother. <laughs> had six boys. And we all got four of us. We got all, all, got, got all, all finished and came back. Yeah. Now, were the, your brothers in until the end of the war? Or what? Well, uh, what do you mean? Well, did they, were they in the, oh, yes. service mm -hmm. through the end of the war? Mm -hmm. I was the third one to go in, yeah. Uh -huh. And the other, 
they were all drafted, I enlisted, you know, because of the reason I told you. Yeah. And um, we got back. Yeah. So it is. Okay. Well, very good. Thank yeah, you. I appreciate it's this. Been a delight. Yeah, I appreciate this. Thank yeah, you very much. Thanks for all you did Thank for you. us. Thank you, Dennis.